Um, thank you very much. Um, just by a raise of hand, who here heard about Tizen before, just for me to know? One, two, three, all right, uh, four, five. That's, that's decent, all right, cool. Um, well, hello everybody, thank you for coming to my talk about breaking Tizen, or as I tried to rephrase it as fantastic vulnerabilities and where to find them. Um, before we start, a little bit about myself. My name is Amichai Neidermann. I'm a security researcher from Israel. I work for a company called Azimut Security from Australia, if you heard of them. Uh, I mostly do security research. Most of my job involves finding vulnerabilities in Android and iOS. Um, that's my day job. My hobby is looking for vulnerabilities in what people nowadays call IoT. I just call it boxes. I like finding vulnerabilities in different kind of boxes, usually stuff that have Wi-Fi in them. It's, it's fun, you get to see a lot of different technologies. You, some of the projects are really easy to do. It's like a really good, nice hobby. Now, before we start talking about what Tizen is, for those who never heard of it, um, I want to say a few words about its history. Now, the history of Tizen is too complicated for even an hour uh, long talk. So as you can see here in this graph, if you can see it clear enough. Um, so I made this graph instead. It's not 100% accurate. It's really not accurate, but it's good enough for the purpose of this talk. Now, Samsung, for a really long time, wanted to have their own operation system, uh, in-house operation system. So in 2010, they started doing something the, called the SLP, the Samsung Linux platform. Um, it didn't really catch up. I don't think anybody ever heard of it or used it, or used it anywhere. Um, after that, they moved to something called BADA um, in 2011. It also didn't really catch up. I think they only ran it successfully on some digital cameras, but not more than that. So eventually, in 2013, they took all the code base from SLP, BADA, and from some other companies like Intel and Nokia merge it into one huge project called Tizen, and that's kind of the Tizen that we know today and that we're gonna talk about. Now, Tizen, according to Samsung, is supposed to be the operation system of everything. And when they say everything, they actually mean everything. It's supposed to run on smartphones, tablets, in-vehicle infotainment uh, devices, smart TVs, PCs, smart cameras, wearable computing, Blu-ray players, printers, smart home appliances, refrigerators, lightning, washing machines, air conditioners, ovens, microwaves, and even robotic vacuum cleaners. Basically, everything. Now, you may not be aware of it, but maybe some of you already own a Tizen device. Maybe the most notable one is the Gear S2 that started as an Android device in the first place, but then Samsung changed it to Tizen somewhere mid-2014 and didn't actually tell anybody about it and got a lot of people pissed because of it. And another really common Tizen device is the uh, Samsung Smart TV. All the new models are running Tizen nowadays. There are about 21 million uh, Samsung Smart TVs with Tizen worldwide. Um, so if you're from the CIA, it's a really good uh, talk to listen to. Now, not so recently, they even started selling smartphones with Tizen on them. They are all labeled with the letter Z, unlike the letter S for their Galaxy series. Um, they're not part of the Galaxy, even though some of them look similar. And if you look at the firmware, you can find a lot of similarities and you can find the strings for Galaxy in all, all kinds of places. Even here in this picture, you can see uh, the My Galaxy, it's an app installed on a Tizen device that, that they claim have nothing to do with uh, Galaxy. And the Tizen look and feel, specifically in the mobile world, is very much like, um, like you'd expect from Android. And it makes sense because Samsung really helped to shape the user experience in, uh, in Android with their TouchWiz. You've seen it for the years. They had a lot of impact on it. So they want to have something that was similar that the, their users are already accustomed to, so you can see the exact same tile layout, the exact same way to present the apps. Um, they didn't want to do too drastic of a change. So this is Tizen on mobile phones. This is how it looks like. Now, oh, what happened? Sorry. 
Now, this year in January in CS, Samsung unveiled their newest product lines, and most of them, most of them are running Tizen. You can see they have Tizen washing machines, Tizen refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, uh, robotic vacuum cleaners, and they even start, start talking about developing more Tizen mobile phones. And it looked like for people who follow it that Samsung are planning something big for Tizen. Maybe even making it their main operation system instead of Android. And it makes sense because over the last decade, Samsung has been using uh, Google's Android as its primary operation system uh, for the mobile devices. Now, the two companies benefit a lot from this partnership because uh, Samsung manufactured quality phones like the S2, the S6, and the Note 7, controlling about 60% of the smartphone market worldwide. And Google got um, its operation system into millions of different homes and users. That's what they wanted, to get more access. And they got it through Samsung. But in this partnership, uh, there were some problems because Google, controlling the operation system, forced Samsung to do a lot of stuff that they didn't want, really want to do in the first place. Like they told them that they have to put the Google search engine, they have to put the Google Play Store, they have to put Android Pay and a lot of other applications that are now in direct competition with uh, Samsung itself. Samsung wanted to have their own uh, store, but Google didn't allow them. They wanted to have their own paying app and Google didn't allow them to do that. Now, but now Google have their, they have their Android operation system and they have their Pixel phone, they have their own uh, hardware and they're not that uh, dependent on Samsung anymore to create quality phone. Um, Apple have their iOS and their iPhone that now comes in red. And it makes sense that Samsung will want to have their own operation system to run on their own hardware so they can do whatever they want with it without anybody telling them what to do and not, what not to put there. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about Tizen under the hood, how Tizen is actually built and what's going on there. So Tizen is essentially Linux. The core is open source, um, but the rest of the ecosystem is maintained by Samsung. And, and one thing that people missed in my last talk, if you've seen it, that I published it in April, in April, a lot of people got confused between the Tizen open source project and the ecosystem that Samsung developed for Tizen. Tizen itself, the open source project, is very similar to Linux. I'm not even sure what the differences are there. There are some, I'm not even sure. Um, but the ecosystem is maintained a lot by Samsung and there you can find the majority of what I'm gonna talk about uh, to be found. Now, Samsung wrote some parts of the networking from what I've seen uh, and kept it closed source. And like I said, most of the apps were developed by Samsung. And they also have the same concept of apps just like in iOS and Android. And you can develop apps in two pretty cool ways. One way is using the web framework. Uh, you can write your app just like you write a uh, a website using JavaScript and HTML, pretty easy to develop. If you can build a site, you can build an app there. It's pretty easy to, uh, to use, pretty cool. Or you could do it the old fashioned way, just write a native app using C or C++. Uh, it's cool, but it could, could potentially cause security problems as we can see later on. As for security, they decided to use Mac instead of SE Linux. Um, I'm not really sure why, Maybe they want to, dif uh, to, dif to, se to separate themselves from Android, but you'll see that later on that they still have a lot of stuff that are very similar to Android. The first thing I noticed that was very similar to Android but wasn't was in Android we have the ADB, the Android Debug Bridge, and in Tizen we have the SDB, which stands for, that's right, the Smart Debug Bridge, and not Samsung Debug Bridge as you'll think. So now we know basically everything you need to know about Tizen to start actually talking about it. Uh, we know that Samsung gambling a lot about it, uh, on its success. They invest a lot of years in developing it. But when I started looking at it uh, at the beginning of the year, there are about two countries in the world using 
uh, Tizen in their mobile phones, India and Bangladesh. So it brings me to a question of why exactly did I start researching Tizen in the first place? So I was looking one day, as part of my job, I was looking at some uh, Android firmwares, because that's what I do. And I noticed those three strings, install WGT, install WGT in APK, and is WGT installed? Anybody here ever heard about WGT? No, 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 yes. All right, nobody heard of it, great. Um, so didn't I, uh, I started reading about it online and the only things I found about it were that it's the new file format for Tizen, Samsung newest OS, uh, for apps. I said, all right, never heard of it, don't really care, not sure why you'd find that inside a, a Galaxy S8 or 7 firmware, but fine, whatever, it's there. Uh, and I didn't really give it much of a thought. But a few days later, I went myself and bought a new Samsung TV, 60-inch uh, TV, and on the box they had uh, this Magnolia sign, and it said it's a Tizen TV. And I remember this Tizen, I, heard, I remember I heard this name before, and then I remember that a few days ago I started reading about it on Wikipedia or something, and I said, well, that's interesting, I wanna, I wanna hack my TV. Let's start working with this. So I started reading about Tizen online, and I got to this site, tizenstore.com. It's basically uh, like going to Google Play through your browser. It's the same thing. Now, it's an official Samsung site. This is their uh, store for downloading apps. And the thing I noticed that is that, that they translate into two languages, uh, English and some Hindu lingu language. Um, and they only support two countries. Bangladesh and India. When I got there about two days later, they added a new country, Nepal. Now, I checked online and they weren't even selling uh, phones or anything with Tizen in Nepal. So it was kind of interesting. And it looked like a cool way to predict where Samsung are planning to start selling next. Because a couple of days later, they announced that they're gonna start selling phones in Nepal. And I thought, well, I have a really cool way to predict where, the, where are they gonna sell next. And in the course of a few uh, months, they added more and more countries. They add translations to more countries. And still there are countries that you can see here that they're not selling Tizen phones to this day. And for me, it looked like Samsung are laying the groundwork for a greater expansion of Tizen into new markets. And even since my original talk, they, they added more countries, a lot more countries. And I think they even added a couple in the last couple of days. Uh, and they're still not selling those countries. You can see that they're starting to uh, get certifications for Tizen phones in South America. It, they're planning to do something really big about it uh, with Tizen. And you can see the exact same thing if you look at their firmware. This is the firmware from 2014. In 2014, they only supported one country, India. They had support for only Indian MCCs, that means you could only connect to Indians' uh, networks by default, and it supported only several Hindu languages plus English, and just like you'd expect from any uh, Hindu firmware, they had this fantastic cricket app. This is the only game that they had uh, back then, and apparently cricket is something really big in India. I didn't, I didn't know that, but apparently. Um, and if we look at the firmware from 2015, not long after uh, the other firmware, we can see that they're starting to adding new countries like Bangladesh and Nepal, even before they announced they're gonna sell that in Bangladesh and Nepal, and even Sri Lanka. And they added a Muslim prayer time app, probably aiming for a Muslim population. And you can see if you go to uh, the SwiftKey database uh, directory, that they add support for a lot more countries that they even declared. You can see that they have uh, support for languages from India, England, uh, Korea, China, Pakistan. So they, a lot of, they add support for a lot of languages for countries that they're not planning to sell yet, but they are planning to do it. So what I've been trying to explain to you in the basically past 10 minutes is that Samsung 
is planning something big for Tizen. It's not as big as Android right now, but it looks like they're planning to do something big about it. Then trying to implement it into every device, new device that they're making. And they might be thinking of changing to Tizen from Android in the long term. And we should all be paying attention for this, especially if you're a security researcher. It's something that you want to look at um, because the state of this operating system is not very good. Now, Samsung is trying to bring developers into Tizen for a long time. They're trying to lure them in all kinds of different ways because they want to make more traction to this operation system because it's not as developed as Android. There aren't enough applications like in Android and iOS. And currently they're thinking that this is their biggest problem uh, before they could take over the entire smartphone market with it. So one way that they're starting to uh, lure programmers into developing Tizen is first of all creating the remote test lab. Something interesting that you should all uh, hear know about because it's cool for just regular testing if you want to try stuff, maybe you want to mess around with it, it could be fun. Um, Samsung lets you try as a developer, uh, it lets you try your actual application on actual physical phones that are located somewhere in their test labs. You could apply for a time slot of between 30 minutes to two hours, and they give you an actual phone that looks like this. They ask you nicely and politely to log out from Facebook afterwards because people could get this phone and then get your account. And you can try everything that you want uh, on those phones. Even before I got real and real actual Tizen phones, I used a lot to test things on those phones. And at the first, at first they only had two locations for this uh, for this lab. They had one in Korea and one in India. But gradually over time, they added support in Poland and in the U.S. Probably trying to bring more developers from Eastern Europe and North America. And another thing that they started doing is very aggressively trying to bring uh, developers and trying to convince them to port their applications into Tizen is giving away each month 10,000 darts for the top 100 apps in their app store, which has about, I guess, 100 apps only. Um, it's not very, <laughs> yeah, it's not very advanced. Um, and lastly, the last thing that they did was to join the .NET Foundation. And that's interesting because they're trying to make .NET uh, trying to make C-sharp uh, what Java is for Android, and trying to bring a lot of .NET developers into the Tizen world. So it will be really easy for them to start developing apps. But for me, what brought me eventually to Tizen was the fact that if you go to cvdetails.com, this is what you see. Zero vulnerabilities in Tizen, an operation system that you could find on millions of devices worldwide in most of the smart TVs in the world, in millions of uh, smartphones in developing countries like India, and not a single vulnerability. And I want to be the first to do it. Now, not long after, um, Samsung announced that they bought the company. Uh, they invested about $10 million in a company that will do a security solution for their apps. And I really want to, do to know where this money went to. So I went ahead and bought two Tizen phones. I think the only Tizen phones that ever came to Israel. I ordered that from some guy from India. This is the first one. This is the Z1. And this is the Z2 or 3. This is Z3. Anybody seen a Tizen phone before? Yeah, apparently there are millions of those. So I went myself and bought a couple of those. It's actually a pretty fun and good phone. Uh, if somebody wants to see it later on, I'll show it to you. And I started researching them. Now, before we start talking about what I found during my research, um, I'm going to talk about some of the things I noticed during the research. And I compile, compiled a list of rules that I think every Tizen developer in the world followed this list of rules. And I call it being a Tizen developer, the untold rules. The first one, <coughs> a string shall never be longer than 256 bytes. There is no reason for a string to be that long, right? Nobody. Uh, 
Second is men in the what attack. And if you're not sure you need SSL, don't use it. I trust everything that claims it came from Samsung. You tell me when to stop reading data. With one gigabyte of RAM, malloc will never fail. And finally, no code review is needed ever. Never. Now, the first app I looked at was the Tizen Store. It's basically, like I said, like Google Play. It's probably maybe the main reason for the making of Tizen, because Samsung really want to have their own app store to try to put it a few ways, a couple of times on uh, different uh, Galaxy devices. If you go through all the crapware that they install in your devices, you can find uh, they change the name, it's called the Galaxy Store, Galaxy Apps, or something like that. Uh, they find a way to put the store, they have about 15 different apps. Uh, most of them are just flashlights um, and one game for catching mosquitoes. Uh, but they, they really wanted it, something that they really wanted was very important for them, so now they have it. Um, it's installed on every Tizen device. And it's really high privileged because it's supposed to install apps, remove apps, update them. So it's a good place to start looking at. Now, a bit on a technical note, the way it works, it's pretty simple. Um, it works over a simple textual protocol uh, over HTTP. There are about 100 different messages that the client can uh, send to the server and vice versa. And most of them follow rule number three of use as less SSL as possible. And they even implemented this function, uh, which is called is secure connection needed, that checks for every single message that the device trying to send out to the server. It's going over, through, over this list and check if it's supposed to be in a secure connection or not. It's supposed to be in plain HTTP or, in, or under SSL. So for every single connection, it, on the device, it checks this. And let's see in a, like an example for, of one of those messages that, are, that is being sent under a plain HTTP. It's called send image download. And basically what it does, it just takes a URL of an image that it got before and is trying to download it to the device to show the user a picture of a, probably another flashlight app. So what it does, it takes the image URL, as you can see here, and copies it using SCR copy because Samsung into a fixed size array of 512 bytes, leading to a heap overflow, a pretty simple one actually. And well, just a bonus point, they're trying to malloc something and never checking if they managed, if they succeeded in that. So if well, we can see that this function has it all. They're using absolute unsafe functions. They're not checking for array bounds. They have null defs. But most, mostly of all, you can see that nobody with any security training even tried to look at this code. Nobody ever did a proper code review for their Samsung app for the Tizen store. This is supposed to be like the most core foundation uh, application in the entire operation system in their ecosystem, and nobody even tried to look at it security-wise. And here's another thing. This is actually a vulnerability I exploited in the end. Um, this, this is called the parse uh, responser. I'm not sure, can you see it from here? Yeah. Um, so, by the way, you might be wondering why I got, how I have all these really nice strings and names, names for the functions, for the, for, uh, the variables, and all the logs. Somebody in Samsung managed to compile all of their source uh, with debug symbols. So that really, really helped uh, during the research. So thanks for that, Samsung. Now, sometimes, and well, when I say sometimes, it happens a lot on this device, things break. And they don't usually work very good. So they need to have some kind of mechanism to handle all the problems that uh, just occurred. And this function handles all kind of server problems. Now, the server can send you uh, the list of its, the problems that it had in two manners. It could either send a list of, uh, of problems, like just a list of numbers, 
in an array or it can send a custom string saying I had this kind of failure or whatever we don't feel like working today. Now, if, you're, if the server decides to send it as a custom string, then we'll get this. You see here that they're using just taking the error string and copying it into a fixed size array of 256 bytes called error string, leading to another heap overflow. And this one is actually, well, I don't think I'll show it here, uh, but if somebody wants to see it later on, I can show you how this thing is exploitable on well, when I charge this device. Um, so this thing is actually exploitable. Uh, everything is done under uh, plain HTTP here. Uh, so it's really easy to trigger because this kind of message is being sent all the time between the server and the client. Um, and like the, old, like the other function we also have here, uh, they're using obsolete unsafe function, not checking for array bounds, checking their, and they're checking there is enough uh, data for heap overflow and overflowing it by, we missed this, they're checking here in this SGL land that the error string is actually contains something to overflow it. So thank you, Samsung. Now, yeah. Um, so like I said, this was actually exploitable. And when, when I kept looking at other you know, pieces of code, the list just goes on. We have no check for array bounds, no proper stop condition, no validating return values, path traversal. But actually did a pretty good job defending from SQL injection. That's actually something they were pretty good at, I must say. <laughs> Somebody taught them about SQL injection and they tried to fix it in every other place. And if you ever play Pokemon, most of the, those vulnerabilities were like Ratata. They're pretty crappy. You can find them anywhere in the ecosystem. Pretty easy to find. Now, another app I was looking at was the Samsung Cloud. They got really jealous that everybody have a cloud today. They want to have their own cloud. So they create a cloud. And this is a piece of code uh, that handles uh, some parts of the update. And you can see here some other really good examples of good coding practices. The first one, and I think that says everything, is the second line. You can see they have a mem set for a buffer that they allocate in the size of 1,000 hacks. And they all, then they're mem setting 1,001 bytes, doing a off by one always, for some apparent reason. Um, so that's one thing. The other one is reading from the socket into bufflen and then mallocating uh, as much data as was sent before and reading some other kind of data in different amount, different size and copying into it. So you can just send, yeah, um, the size of my data is gonna be zero bytes, then sending 10,000 bytes and making a heap overflow. So that's a really good example of their coding practices. Um, now, I don't think this talk will be complete without uh, browser vulnerability. Because I know people really like that today. People, I want to see it in Pwn to Own and all kind of different competitions. I'm not really much of a browser guy. I never looked at browsers before, but for the sake of this talk, I opened for the first time uh, a browser code and started uh, looking for vulnerabilities and actually found two vulnerabilities in their Samsung mobile browser. Now, a couple of hours before my original flight in April, uh, I was talking to Samsung and I wanted to send them the vulnerabilities, but apparently somebody, one of those developers, I'm not sure which is who did it actually, uh, I saw it in the Git, fixed the vulnerabilities, fixed. They changed the code and they erased the vulnerability that was there, just changed the logic of the code. But they already promised Samsung a vulnerability and they were already talking about uh, browser vulnerability and they seemed really obsessed about the vulnerability in the browser. So I was sitting in my, with my laptop in the airport waiting to board my flight and I found this. Um, and I think uh, it is their mind for a while until I had a connection in France. So you can see here in this scanf, um, you can, if you put only one char before, one character before the null byte terminator, it would think you read two bytes and the in pointer will move uh, forward twice. 
and then to a buffer overflow in the end. So uh, I did promise them a vulnerability and I found one. And if you want to make a quick summary of what we actually talked about till now, uh, I found about 40 different vulnerabilities in, I guess in a couple of hours I was looking at this. Um, most of them felt like it was 2005. Um, one was exploited for fun, the one I showed you before. I had one mini heart attack when I tried to check one of the vulnerabilities, the original browser vulnerabilities on my TV, on my brand new TV, and not this crappy phone that cost about $50. And it crashed my TV. So I was really scared because it was pretty expensive and a new TV and didn't want my wife to be mad at me. <laughs> But the TV is working and it's all good now. Um, so I had this mini heart attack. Now, I started talking to Samsung before uh, I even released uh, this talk. And at first, they didn't really bother to uh, contact me back. And I heard it happen to a lot of people until I talked to one reporter and she tried to talk to them. They didn't respond in time and I already uh, release the story to the public and then you can maybe imagine the way how things work with Samsung with this, the five stages of grief. Shock, denial, anger and guilt, despair and depression and acceptance. So that's the best way to describe it. Now at first they were in shock. This is not the actual conversation but like I said before uh, I talked to some guy from Samsung who works in the smart television department. And he started talking to me and he was really confused. He asked if I can send him all the vulnerabilities I found in an orderly fashion way. I told him I'm on my way to the airport right, right now. I'll send you the presentation, gather whatever you want. Uh, you, you, you can understand what, what to fix from, if you know what you're doing, you can understand what to fix from, uh, my, from my presentation. Then he started asking me if those vulnerabilities affect the smart TVs. I told him some of them are. I think, no, they closed it. I need to check it. Then he said, well, maybe it's, because uh, if it's not uh, affecting the TVs, then it's only affecting those smartphones in at, like, those evolving countries. I told him, uh, yeah, something like this. Well, fuck them. I don't really care about them. They don't buy, they don't buy smart TVs. They're a problem. <laughs> And that was pretty weird. <laughs> and it was all done through Facebook and some emails. Then they came to denial. Um, first they claimed, they told all the reporters that contact them that no, their code is the best, they have no vulnerabilities in their code, everything is great. Um, after that they tried to, they actually sent me an email saying, yeah, we looked at it. Um, it's not the, uh, the television department fault. All the vulnerabilities are originated from the mobile department fault. You should talk to them. It's not our problem. Like, all right. They know that you're two different companies or something, but all right. Then they said they're gonna start, that they're gonna update, that they fixed everything, that they updated their Samsung store. And I went and checked if they updated everything and nope, still vulnerable. Um, you can find the exact same thing there. And then came anger. Then they started telling people that I'm not really complying with them because I only send them a short list of my vulnerabilities and my presentation and a few emails and one phone call and some Facebook talks and direct messages on, uh, on Twitter. And I wasn't cooperating enough. I wasn't fixing their code or whatever. Um, and they actually started leaking some of my emails to them. Uh, one of them saying, I'm about to board a flight or I'm on vacation, I can't help you right now. So they were pretty pissed and tried to shit mouth me sometimes, but it was okay, nobody believed them. Only one Russian site uh, started writing really weird uh, stories about me. Now, they weren't really desperate because they don't really, I don't think they really care about uh, security that much or they're too big of a company to really be desperate. All right, so people don't like our Tizen. We rebrand re it in a month or something. We call it Tizen 4. There's actually Tizen 4 now. Um, we call it Tizen 4 and we'll say everything is great. And then came the acceptance. 
if you remember this piece of code of is secure connection needed, now they changed it to this. I think that's the best patch you could do for this. No need for all for this advanced logic of checking for if for every connection you need to ch to uh, send it for SSL. You just need to always use SSL. It's not that hard today. It doesn't cost you any money to do it. The servers could could handle this. This fifty dollar device could handle this SSL. And they even removed all the symbols, but I already have all the symbols, and I'm going to upload them. So if somebody wants, you can just use my new symbols because they removed all trace of them and they stopped using SGR copy altogether. They're now using SNPrintf. Um, so they did try to do some stuff, um, but then the community started to get involved. So some guy, some Polish guy that used to, to work for Tizen, uh, I met him at the Daily What The Fuck some website for programmers to release some steam about their employers or parts of code that they've seen, um, started finding all kinds of vulnerabilities. The first one that he sent me was an SQL injection because I couldn't find one. So somebody missed, even though that they were taught how to defend against SQL inject injections. And some other really interesting piece of codes like uh, doing a fork and using the argv as your storage space for, uh, sorry, for uh, the child process. So now every process needs to start with at least 200 characters at the beginning so you'll have some spare space to move, to send data it's, if it's going to do some forking. And maybe if you, you've heard of them, um, this is some Russian company called PVS Studio that um, designed some kind of software to do static analysis and well they got they liked my uh, presentation a lot and they ran their product on Tizen and they got about 27,000 errors in Tizen uh, some of them not all of them but some of them are exploitable and I think they put in their blog that you can see here they have a lot of examples I think this is uh, how they presented it, vomiting unicorn. So they just have a few pages of different vulnerabilities, all kind, a lot of heap overflows, tacos, uh, use after freeze, whatever you want. And they t they're talking to me once in a while, saying that they found some other interesting stuff. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so yeah, they did find a lot of stuff. Um, Samsung also tried to tell them that uh, most of the stuff are bullshit. Uh, nobody believes Samsung at this point. Um, so there actually, there is a problem with Tizen. It's not as, it's not as protected as Samsung thought it will be. Um, but the com community are now trying to uh, help and fix stuff. I, I'm also trying to find more vulnerabilities and help Samsung close them. I'm not sure how to apply for a CV number. It's, I guess, really hard. Um, so I'm not doing it, but I did help uh, close a few bugs. And mostly I really want to see Galaxy S9 with Tizen on it because it could be a really decent operation system that could fight iOS and Android, make it more diverse, make the other operation systems better. Um, but for that to happen, uh, more people need to help uh, Samsung close and patch those bugs, make it a more stable operation system, more secure, and not just leave a vulnerable operation system for Indian people and African people today. So, join the Tizen ecosystem, a new business opportunity for you, if you're a security researcher. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> uh, 
Yes. Uh, questions or did you say something else? Yes. Sorry. Have you been credited by Samsung for any of this done? Um, Not necessarily getting a CV, but just having your name uh, at the bottom of the page. Well, in some of the mails and uh, well, you can internal the mailing list of Tizen, um, Samsung representative did say that they well that they have uh, that they did find and fix some of my bugs, um, especially the one in the open source project, like the one in the browser. It was an open source uh, vulnerability that I found. Um, they didn't put it in their security website because. Their security website is only aimed to f towards uh, Android, so don't have any. It's called SV in Samsung. I don't. It's not uh, aimed towards uh, Tizen, only Android, from what I understand. I know that the the Tizen Wikipedia article uh, contains my name now. Somebody wrote it, so I did get a lot of credit for it, but not from not directly from Samsung. They didn't put it in their in one of their uh, official sites saying this guy found these vulnerabilities. So, like, there's no whole fan in Samsung that don't need. Um, I think that they, I don't think they like me very much right now. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so there's no whole fame. I know the guys from LG likes me, they told me that. I think we have time for another question. Uh, I have your question. All right. I think we're done then. No? Okay. Uh, no, I don't, no, no. Uh,